Welcome to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, email it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives, and become one of our friends on Facebook. Facebook.com slash Radio Detectives. Before we do get started, I do want to encourage you, if you've not already, pick up your copy of my first detective novel, Slime Incorporated. It's available as a paperback or also an ebook form. You can check out that book as well as all my others at store.greatdetectives.net. Well, we had one lo- lost episode between last week's show and this week's. So here now, from June the 15th of 1954, is the Contessa Lafresso murder. <laughs> Crime and Peter Chambers. Created by Henry Kane, transcribed and starring Dane Clark. Private investigator, duly licensed and duly sworn, Peter Chambers. You're a private eye. That's your business. Anything else? That's for laughs. It's 5.30 in the afternoon and you're at a cocktail party on Park Avenue. Right up to now, you've been bored. But that was right up to now. Before you saw her. Now you've seen her. And she's about as beautiful as anything you've ever seen in your life. She's seated at a piano, idly doing improvisation. Uh, may I, uh... Oh, is it all right? May I sit here beside you? Why, yes, certainly. I'd been hoping you would. Well, now... You're Peter Chambers, aren't you, honey? The detective-type fella? Oh, I love that Harmony Grits accent. My name's Lenore. And I love that name. Mr. Peter Chambers? I just couldn't perk up enough nerve to approach you, but I did so want to talk with you. Hmm. Mr. Peter Chambers? Uh, oh, that's for you, uh, isn't it? Look when. Uh, here, I'm uh, Peter Chambers. Uh, uh, telephone call for you, sir. Where? Uh, just follow me, sir. All right, I'll be back, Lenore. Don't go away. I'll be waiting. You're right this way, sir. Thank you. Here you are. Thank you. Hello? Pete? Hello, Pete? Oh, no. It's Louis Parker, Detective Lieutenant Parker. Oh, can I lose you anywhere? Here I am at a park in your shindig, yeah, Louis. Yeah, and... it's a good thing I knew where to find you. It's murder, Pete. Well, what else when Parker of homicide is involved? Look, one of our suspects is a kid by name of Jack March. Jack March. I know that boy. Yeah, he won't talk to cops. But he says he will talk to you. He'll talk to Peter Chambers only. Well, if that's the way it is, Louis. When do you need me? Right away. High View Apartments on Sutton Place. Apartment 16A. Hey, very fancy. And who lives there? The Contessa La Fresso. Wow, that's real fancy, too. Is she there? She's here. And she ain't here, if you know what I mean. She's dead. All right, I'll be there. Good boy. Bye now. <laughs> Detective Lieutenant Louis Parker... When he asks a favor, you jump. Because with you, as with everyone else, Louis Parker rates. Only with you, he rates special because you don't only respect him as a cop, you respect him as a friend. So you get to Sutton Place, the apartment of the Contessa La Fresso. Park is there. A lovely redheaded maid is there. Jack March is there. And one other guy. A tough baby by the name of Stoney Carter. Uh, how long are you, going to you know everybody here, Pete? Hi, Mr. Chambers. How are you, Jack? I'm lousy. I think I'm in the middle of a quick frame. Now just hold it, young fella. Pete, uh, you know Stoney Carter? Me and a shamus, we have met now and then. I've always preferred the then to the now. You know what the play on words. <laughs> Stoney Carter. A hoodlum from way back. An easy money guy that's always stayed inside the law. 
Not so young Jack March. A good kid turned wrong and then turned right again. He's done a stretch and he's been paroled and you're one of those who made character for him. He's driving a cab last you heard. But the redhead's more attractive than both of them put together. And you're beginning to debate between the redhead and Lenore, but uh, uh, you stay faithful to Lenore. Pete. Yeah? Notice all I've got is three uniformed cops here. My staff is on the way. We haven't really got started yet. And already you've garnered two suspects? Yeah. Come in here, the bedroom. In the bedroom, Parker pulls down a sheet and shows you the Contessa La Presso. Dead. Knife to death. He points out a switch knife lying on the dresser. The dresser's also got two vases on it. One with gardenias and one with orchids. The flowers wilted and tired. Red-headed maid came back and found her like that. Came back from where? Let me get the sheet back over the Contessa. Yeah, she doesn't look very pretty now. Okay. Denise, will you come in here, please? Oui, monsieur. Denise Monet, Peter Chambers. How do you do? How do? Denise, would you uh, tell Mr. Chambers just what happened? Well, it was about ten minutes to five. Madame was in bed napping. I knew she had an appointment at five, so I woke her. An appointment? With whom? Uh, with Monsieur Stoney Carter for five o'clock. The other one was for five thirty. What other one? The other appointment. What other appointment? The one with uh, Monsieur Jacques Marsh. Okay, Miss Denise, so you woke her up. Oh, she was very tired. We only came home today from a week in the country. There was shopping to do, and she told me to go and do it. The shopping. But I say, Madame, you will have a guest shortly. And what did she say? She yawned and say, So he will wake me up. Leave the door unlocked. Which is just what she does. She leaves the door unlocked and blows. She comes back at 20 after 5. She finds your friend, Jack March, standing in here. Knife is in his hand, and the Contessa, she's dead. So quickly, I call the police, and quickly the police come. And what does Jack March do in the meantime? He stands like, um, oh, how you say it, um, uh, petrified. Hey, petrified is pretty good. And we find him like that, knife in his hand. And, of course, he clams. The poor kid. He don't trust cops. He starts wailing for Peter Chambers. He don't trust law, but he trusts Peter Chambers. Look, he's a good kid, Louis. Good kid, schmood kid. He's got a knife in his hand. He's here on the scene. What does he get for that, the purple heart? And that bum out there, the first appointment, the five o'clock guy, Stoney Carter. What about him? Well, the minute Denise gives us the story, one of my boys picks him up at his place. Where is his place? Hotel Bilton. He'd hardly got there. Still had his hat on. Okay. So, I suppose you want me to talk to the kid? Yeah, I wish you would. For his sake. All right. But let's sort of do it in a hurry. I've got to get back to a party. Oh, business deal there, Pete? Well, not exactly business. Uh, uh-huh. Well, yeah, if you want to put it that way. Now, look, Miss Denise. Uh, oui, Monsieur Chambre. Ooh, aren't you the cute one? Ooh, oui, Monsieur Chambre. Oh, you the niece, you. You know, if there wasn't a Lenore... Uh, I... Lenore, there is perhaps, but Lenore's... Oh, poof, there are many. There is but one, Denise. You know, I got a small hunch. You're right, honey. Well, look, lover boy, break it up, huh? What did you, what did you want to ask you? Uh, sorry, Louie, lost my head. Now, these flowers here, Denise, what are they? Orchids and gardenias. A bow of the contest he gives them last week. Mm, they're all wilted. Of course. It was last week. Oh. And we have been away all this week. Now, look, Pete, uh, you want to talk to the kid now? I'll talk to both of them. Stony Carter first, if it's all right with you, Louie. Yeah, sure. In here or out there? Out there. Crazy French maid. Stoney. At your service, Lieutenant. Tell Mr. Chambers your tale of woe, huh? Tale of woe. <laughs> hey, simple. Okay, let's hear it. I got a date with the Contessa for five bells. I come. I knock. No answer. I try the door. It's open. I goes in. Finds her asleep. I wake her. We chop chop. But she ain't in the mood for no company. She's sleepy. So I blow the joint. How long did you stay? Oh, maybe 10, 15 minutes. And then? I get back to my hotel. And ain't there maybe a minute when wham, banging on the door. Cops. They lug me back here. That's it. Okay, now you, Jack March. Your personal private eye is here. You want to unclam now? 
Or you want a personal private trip downtown? Easy, Lou, easy, will you? Jack. Yeah? You trust me, don't you, kid? Yes, sir. Mr. Chambers? All right, tell me what happened. Look, they'll railroad me. I've been in the can once. I don't want it. I don't want it no more. Look, Mr. Chambers, I'm driving a hack. Special OK from the hack bureau. I'm doing it all right. Now I got to get caught up in this. What happened, kid? Well, I had a date with her for 5.30. Yeah. I come early. Like Stoney says, the door was open. Only I don't find her asleep. I find her dead. And there's a knife on the floor. I like a dope, I picks it up and... Then the maid barges in. What am I going to do? Me with a ship in my hand? Stab her and make a run for it? So I just stand there like the big dope I am, and that's it. A dead dame, a knife, and me in the middle. You didn't kill her, did you, kid? You think he'd sell you if he did? Yes, Louie, I think he would. I didn't. I didn't kill her. Why should I kill her? Pete, uh, come over here a minute, huh? Parker takes you aside and thanks you. The staff will be here soon, and they'll take over on the scientific aspects. So, since there's nothing left for you to do, you tell Parker to keep you posted and that you're going back to that Park Avenue shindig, and back there you go. Hi, Mr. Chambers. Hi. It's so good to see you again. I told you I'd be back, Lenore. Uh, Lenore, uh... Stanhope. Oh, beautiful girl, beautiful name. Another beautiful name happened to me just a short while ago. Denise. Oh, honey. There are so many Denises. But there's only one little old Lenore. <laughs> you know, you two must have studied in the same book. But, Lenore, my love, I am faithful unto you. Let us go <laughs> gather cocktails. You're just the man for a criminologist to meet. Who needs criminologists? I've got you. I... <laughs> Mr. Chambers. Mr. Chambers. Oh, oh, here's that man again. All right, here, here I am. A phone call, Mr. Chambers. Thank you. Uh, what's your name? Livingston, sir. Lead me to it, Mr. Livingston. And Lenore, once more, my apologies. This way, Mr. Chambers. You go to the phone, and guess who? We've got developments, Pete. Look, I'm working on a few developments myself, Louis. We're booking your boy, but there have been a couple of interesting developments. Oh, uh, like what? Well, that's not for phone talk. I'll wait for you if you promise to come over to the apartment, but pronto. All right, I'll be there as fast as I can. Don't go away. I'll be here, but do it quick, huh? So, once more, you do the apology bit for Lenora Stanhope. You tell her you'll be back, that you'll call her even before you come back. And then you tear yourself away. And you're on your shuttle again. You're back at Sutton Place in the Countess's apartment. And there's nobody there, not even the body. There's only Parker, or a couple of cops, and Stoney Carter. Where's everybody? Well, your boy's downtown being booked. Body's been picked up by the basket boys, and my staff has departed. Well, there was one little bright light down here who was conspicuous by her absence, that Denise. What happened to her? <laughs> You turned on her like a refrigerator, so she kind of shined up to one of my young cops. We went downtown with him. Mm-hmm. You going to brush her up on uh, criminology? Mayhap, my lad, mayhap. Well, there's always Lenore. Lenore? Who that? Private lieutenant. Private for the private eye. <laughs> now, what's with the developments? Well, first, we've got a little motive, finally. Like what? Robbery. There's a brooch missing from a drawer of that dresser in the bedroom. The one with the flowers on it? Mm -hmm. The wilted orchids and gardenias? Yep. Top drawer. Kept the jewelry there. Insured, but the brooch is gone, and it's worth 100,000 bananas. And you mean the dame woke up while one of our two suspects was kind of helping himself to this, uh... Diamond brooch, yeah. Uh -huh. Figure she woke, squawked, got stuck. So? Who stuck her? We say your boy, Jack March. Fingerprints on knife, only one set, his. What about fingerprints on the dresser drawer? Got a smudge, which could have been a fingerprint. And then we got a fingerprint, which turns out to be Stony Carter's. Then why are you holding my boy? Because, one, your boy was caught red-handed with the knife. Two, only his prints are on the knife. And three, the smudge could have been his print, only it got smudged, and that happens often enough. And how does dear old Stoney explain his print? Let him talk for himself. Huh? Sure, Lieutenant. I am happy to oblige. Oh, I love these oily, obliging guys. Okay, big shot. Oblige. It's like this. I get here. She's sleeping. She wakes up. We chat. 
These flowers are all wilted. The petals are all over the dresser. Dropped from these here flowers, you see? I'm a neat guy. Always been a neat guy. So, while we're chatting, I'm kind of cleaning up these petals with fell, you see? I'm shoving them into the palm of my hand. You see, I'm going to dump them down the incinerator. All right, do it a little faster, Stoney, huh? Oh, yeah, young. Well, the top drawer's a little open. Some of them petals I'm cleaning up, brushing them together like some of them fall in there. So I pull a drawer open, take out the ones that fall in, dump the heap into the incinerator. Like that, my print maybe gets on a knob of that drawer. Well, yeah, simple enough to be perfectly logical. Time. Time to go into a huddle again, Lieutenant. You and me, alone. Yeah, sure, Pete. Come in the bedroom. It's empty now. You holding that bird out there? They haven't got on what to hold him. And he's wise enough to know it. He's beefing for his lawyer already. But you're holding the kid, aren't you? A kid who's trying to straighten himself out, driving a oh, cab. He's... Look, be sensible. We got him with the goods. Fingerprints, witness, the works. Well, what about the brooch? Well, our fast figure is he got rid of it somewhere first. And then back here, he's about to clean up on the knifing deal when the maid shows. Oh, now, wait a minute. So he plays it dumb, you see. Stands here, he doesn't make a run for it, and he says he picks the knife up off the But it could be true, can it? Only his prints are on it. But it's possible that the knife was wiped, and then he picked it up. Oh, everything's possible, but we got a case against him. Against the Stoney, we haven't got a thing. You're going to look over his place at the Bilton? Well, we haven't got a right. You need a search warrant for that. You haven't got a thing to base a warrant on. Yeah, but I don't need a warrant. What does that mean? The thing blew wide open fast, and you picked up Stoney at the Bilton. He'd hardly gotten into his place yet. You said yourself he had his hat still on his head. So? So, if maybe he did cop that brooch, it'd still be there. He just didn't have a chance to move it. But I can't get a warrant. I got no grounds for it. Good enough. So that's where little boy private eye fits in. Where? Listen, Louie. Hold him here for half an hour. And then let him go. Give him a five-minute head start, and then you call on him at the Bilton. Strictly a social call. What'll you be working on in the meantime? Me? Be working on trying to get young Jack March out of the can. If I'm wrong, I apologize. If I'm right, a good kid gets spared a lot of grief. Bye now, Louis. So off you go on your scooter. First stop is an old friend, an elderly Greek gentleman who owns a florist shop. You have a bit of discourse on the subject of flowers, including orchids and gardenias. And you come away with some edifying results. Then at the Bilton, you learn that Stoney's place is 426. So you pace the fourth floor corridor waiting for him. There's a phone booth and you use it. Winston residence. Uh, Mr. Livingston, I presume? Uh, this is Livingston, sir. Mr. Chambers, Livingston. Mr. Chambers. Oh, at the other end of the wire this time, sir, eh? <laughs> oh, very funny. Would you page Lenore Stano, please? Uh, no need to page her, sir. She's right here at this end of the wire. Oh, you're killing me. Put her on, will you? One moment, please. Hello? Lenore? This is Pete, Peter Chambers. Oh, sweetie, I thought you'd plumb forgotten me. Oh, swell chance. It's just that I've been torn between what I want to do and, uh, uh, what I want to do. You're not quite coherent, are you, Peter? Well, uh, later I'll be coherent, honey. Special to you, I'll be coherent when I get back. But, honey, when will that be? Soon, honey, very soon now. You'll wait, won't you? Well. Oh, come on now, please wait. I will, if you say so. But I'm beginning to lose patience. You're... You're so gossamer. One moment you're here, the next moment you're gone. Oh, I'll be back, baby, and this time I'll stay. All right, then. We'll wait. You hang up, you mop your brow, and then Stoney comes tearing along like there's a tailwind behind him. He gets his key in the door, he gets in, and you jump him. Uh -huh. Catches you with a couple of wild ones, and you let fly a few wild ones on him. But then he runs into a real beautiful bouquet of knuckles. Oh. And now Stoney is real Stoney. He's also rigid, stretched out on the floor like a welcome mat. You close the door and you get ready for a search, but no real search is needed. 
You'll come up with that brooch faster than a racehorse breaking from the barrier. You just pick it up out of a desk drawer where you dropped it when Parker's cops had come to pick him up. Then there's a rapping on the door. Detective Lieutenant... Hi. It's me. Just dropping in for a social call. Here's your brooch, Louis. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. Well, maybe it'll clear you, kid. But without a search warrant, this bum will accuse you of planting it here. So will his lawyer. Well, where would I have gotten it? From the kid. They'll say the kid slipped it to you, which they'll say is the reason the kid wanted you in the first place. Uh, that's right. That's right. Here, help me up. You had it right, Lieutenant. A plan. It's strictly a plan. It's not going to work, Stoney. Well, say about that. I got lawyers. Lieutenant, that story he gave you about how his print got on that dresser drawer. You got a statement on that? Oh, yeah. A sworn statement. Good, because that statement and this brooch here, together, they'll sit him in the hot seat. But good. I told you about those flowers. I told you how I cleaned up the petals from those gardenias and those orchids. They was all wilted. You saw them yourself. Some of the petals dropped in the drawer. I took them out. That's how the print got on there. Keep talking, pal. You're killing me. And better, you're killing yourself. I don't get it, Pete. You just talk to any florist, Louie, and they'll tell you. Tell me what? That there's a certain special feature about orchids and gardenias. Special feature? Neither gardenias nor orchids shed their petals regardless of age. What? They wither and they'll wilt. But petals, they just don't shed. Wah! You're a liar! No, I'm not, Stoney. Wait till he gets to your lawyer. He'll convince you that this is one time you talked out of turn. That's nice work, Petey. And you, let's go. Downtown, for you, special, I'll fix up your cell with petunias. And so, breathless but determined, you're back at the cocktail party. It's begun to thin out, but Lenore is still there. Ah, oh, the good Mr. Chambers. We were beginning to lose hope. Uh, what's with the we? I thought she said we over the phone, too. What is that, an editorial we? A queenly we? A... Oh, no, purely a grammatical we. Uh? We, myself and my husband. You see, my husband is an amateur criminologist, and he's somewhere about drinking, of course. And when I tell him about the prize catch I have for him... Husband, did you... When did I tell you... him that you're here and a what? man with your wealth of experience is willing to sit around with him and discuss the various topics... Just, 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 can... uh, just a minute, please. Yes. Yeah. Did you say husband? Yes, I said husband. Oh, that's what I thought you said. Oh, that Denise. Oh, my aching back. But, honey, back. child, I... my name's Lenore. Yeah, I know, Lenore. But I'd have sworn you said Denise. I know just what I said. Well, I gotta go now. Bye. Again? And this time, honey, child, I ain't a-coming back. But no how. <laughs> And there you've had Crime and Peter Chambers. Dane Clark was starred as Peter Chambers. Crime and Peter Chambers transcribed was created and written by Henry Kane. Others in the cast were Bill Zuckert, heard as Lieutenant Parker, Ralph Bell as Stoney, Donald Buke as Jack, and Anita Anton as Lenore. It was directed by Fred Way, and this is Fred Collins inviting you to tune in next week, same time, same station, for Dane Clark in Crime and Peter Chambers.
Crime and Peter Chambers has come to you through the worldwide facilities of the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service. Chambers was disappointed, but in the day, at the end of the day, I should say, yet another criminal will face his doom because he didn't study up on botany. As an aside, I also have to say that Ralph Bell was such an essential actor to Golden Age mystery programs. Just a fantastic voice, either to play a heavy or to play a police officer. And I actually heard him uh, in an episode or two of Suspense, where he played a police officer who was also the heavy. Well, now we turn to listener comments and feedback, and we have an email from Joel, who writes in, I'm happy to say that Peter Chambers has grown on me. I'm enjoying the personality that Dane Clark projects, as well as the plots in his relationship with his detective Fred. Thanks for bringing this to me. Well, you're welcome, and I'm glad you're enjoying the series. And having read one Peter Chambers novel, uh, it does seem that the relationship with Louis Parker is something that's organic to the books. Indeed, the books and the radio show are surprisingly similar in their narration. Though the one novel I read wasn't as uh, pro-police as the radio show was. It felt more like a situation similar to the Rockford Files and Dennis in the books. But at any rate, it definitely carries over well on radio, and Dane Clark and Bill Zuckert are great together, and it's not, and it's very unique. It's probably the closest police officer private eye relationship in the golden age of radio. The closest, I, I think, that... Uh, to that would perhaps be between John J. Malone and Lieutenant Brooks. But that's more of a friendly rivalry than anything else. And uh, Pastor Lisa comments regarding episode uh, 1444. Uh, this was really good. Well, thanks so much. I appreciate the feedback. And we will be back tomorrow with the adventures of Philip Marlowe. And then coming uh, up next Tuesday, another episode of Crime and Peter Chambers. In the meantime, send your comments to Box13 at GreatDetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter, Radio Detectives, and become one of our...